Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special CX moment. I'm Sarah Reed from Zendesk, and I'm pleased to be joined today by our very own Chief People and Diversity Officer, Ina Marie, and Smita, Zendesk's VP of Diversity and Inclusion. Also with us today is Kent Hillier, who heads up customer care for 23andMe, the genetic testing and insights company. Before we get started, I want to thank you all for participating in our discussion about racial inequality, solidarity, and the importance of allyship. These are conversations that we all need to have together and with our customers and employees, particularly those in customer facing and support roles. I expect there will be a lot of questions today, so we are prepared to go a bit over time. We'll stay talking if you stay listening and asking. Please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to as many as we can. If you also have a story to share, this is the place for that too. So let's go ahead and get started. Ina Marie, nice to see you today. Helps if I come off mute. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> And it's great to see you as well, Kent and Smita. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Uh, Ina Marie, recently I heard you say on a call internal to Zendesk uh, that we've been on the journey and now we're on a sea change. What exactly do you mean by that? Yeah, thank you for the question and just thank you all for joining us. As Sarah said, these are really important conversations and in particular, thank you, Kent, as one of our customers for joining us. Um, sure, you know, we have been on a journey. I think those of us that have been in business or organizations, diversity and inclusion is not something new. Uh, it's been multiple decades where we know that it is good business to bring in diverse representation, to build in uh, environments where all employees can thrive. And um, I think racism isn't new. You know, um, many of us who are Americans born in this country, we know that racism is woven into the fabric of America. So both of those things have existed. But I would say, this is my point of view, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we watched a black man lose his life very slowly and very deliberately on TV in front of us, something really changed. And this year in particular, there have been a number of deaths, you know, George um, Floyd, um, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor. So you put that together with COVID-19, some mm -hmm. are now saying racism 2020. Those two things mean that it is different now. And this is why I say it's a sea change. I think when you watch the response, people are no longer willing to just accept that. And I'm encouraged and actually have hope because of the global response, Sarah. So for me, the sea change is around the global response. I think it's also the systemic reaction we're seeing. We're actually seeing people look at their laws. Uh, yesterday, you know, we had George Floyd's brother speaking to Capitol Hill about change. We're hearing about po uh, police reform. And the last reason I would say it's a sea change is I'm watching the youth. And uh, recently, President Obama spoke about youth, and he said that, you know, in big uh, times of change, it's usually the youth that come out. And so I'm encouraged with that. All of those things to me, I think, believe, lead me to believe that we are at a sea change, a crossroads. And it's, it's actually really exciting to feel the energy that's out there right now. And knowing that, to your point, these are not new issues. These are, are, are but finally it feels like everyone is talking about it versus pockets of people talking about it. Smita, Zendesk has been really clear that we are going to be part of a solution. And we recently published a commitment uh, to fight racism and discrimination. And what is, how are we actually doing that versus just talking about it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this um, forum. I think it's a very important topic for all of us to discuss, not just because of what happened and I'm not putting any, taking any emphasis away from what happened, but to Ina Marie's point, it has existed for centuries, right? Racism in America is in the fabric of America. Racism outside of America has its own form and different ways of how discrimination shows up in many different ways across the globe. 
with Zendesk, I think I'll go back to what Ina Marie also said, which is, you know, this is a company that was intrinsically basing uh, its values on empathy, on respect, on inclusion. And when we are thinking about that, this is not new for us. What was bold for us to stand up there with our customers, with our employees to stand up there and make a bold statement that we won't stand with it. We can't be silent. We have to stand against any form of risk, discrimination or racism. What was also very important for Zendesk was to follow up very quickly with some commitments so that it's not just all talk, but there is an action and there is a commitment. So the top five commitments that we made as a company, again, to say that this was a continuation of our journey that we were on to continue to make Zendesk globally inclusive. But what the series of unfortunate events forced us to do was put our stake in the ground and say, look, enough is enough and we are going to put our money where our mouth is and make some bold, bold commitments. So I'll walk you through the top five commitments we've made, but that's by no means the be all and end all. This is just the start of our commitment. The first commitment we made was that we can't be silent and at the same time, we have to be humble and listen. We've got to create forums where our employees across different backgrounds can come in and openly speak about how they are feeling. And it's not just about how they are feeling and doing in Zendesk, but it's their lived experience as human beings, right? So we hosted our first empathy circle. Empathy is one of our core values. We hosted our first empathy circle last Friday and a majority of our senior leaders, starting from our CEO, Ina Marie was there, our CEO was there, top executive leaders from the company, join the conversation and listen, simply listen. So our first commitment was to create these empathy circles globally, again, not just US, to listen to our employees and learn from their experience. And we have full commitment to do that uh, over the next quarter. The next commitment we made was to create and publish our first global equity policy. And um, many a times companies would make a statement and would perhaps have these listening sessions, but really go about back to doing business the way they were doing. What we are committed to in Zendesk is we are saying we're going to put a policy in place that will clearly outline what are our zero tolerance limits, right? What, where, where can we say that these kind of, any kind of racism, any acts of discrimination has is a hundred percent non-negotiable and zero tolerance in our company. So that's again, putting our stake in the ground and saying, we will not tolerate anything within Zendesk, right? And that goes hand in hand with our third commitment we made, which is we're going to invest in concepts of bias, racism, privilege, and active allyship across Zendesk, starting from our top executive leaders, right? So again, we are not beating around the bush here and saying we are going to create a warm, welcoming, inclusive environment, which of course is important, but the need of the hour is to talk about specific topics which are really uncomfortable, but right. necessary. So that's where we are talking about these concepts and we said we'll commit to that. The fourth commitment we made was when we think about these topics that are uncomfortable and globally, the managers who are not necessarily equipped. Again, Aina Marie mentioned, it's a young workforce and we are very hopeful, very optimistic, but the young workforce also means you don't have the background or the necessary tools to have conversations. So we are committed to investing in allyship programs and tools and tips so that every manager in every corner of the world in Zendesk knows how to handle these conversations. And the last but not the least commitment we've made as a company is to contribute towards nonprofits that fight racism, that fight discrimination across the globe, not just in the US, but across the globe. So we've already made our contributions towards NAACP and the Southern Poverty Law Center, but more to come. Again, these are just the first five commitments, but we are on a journey and we will continue to push for what is right. Thank you for walking us through those five commitments. And I know we're gonna to touch on or even dive into pretty deep into quite a few of those. Uh, but first I wanna bring Kent into this conversation. And I also wanna just point out, cause I think uh, we had some individuals who joined a, a little late to the conversation. I wanna make sure that everyone realizes uh, who's listening today, that this is very much a conversation. It's a conversation with those of us on screen right now, and it's a conversation with all of you. So please make sure to put in uh, your questions into the Q&A uh, or your stories. We, are, we want to hear them. We want to talk about them. That's really what this uh, conversation is about today. But Kent, let's get back to you. You work for 23andMe. You are a customer of Zendesk, uh, and your company has 
has been really vocal. Uh, and we want to, we're so excited to talk to you uh, about what 23 is doing. Uh, but first, what is the mission of your company and why is it so meaningful right now? Yeah, hi. Thanks for uh, having me. I'm uh, really excited to participate in this. So highest level, our mission is to help people access, understand, and benefit from the human genome. You know, for those of you who don't know, we are a genetic testing company. Anybody can come to us, any individual, and have their DNA analyzed and, and get a series of reports. Uh, some of those reports show your ancestry. It's based purely on science, purely on DNA. It has nothing to do with like records or birth certificates or anything like that. It's all science-backed. There are also some health reports that you can see. Um, but about that you know, ancestry stuff and uh, the human genome and that we are a science-based company, what we see there is that all of us share a common thread and that is DNA. And when you look at the science of that DNA, we are all 99.5% the same. Uh, that means there's only 0.5% that's different, yet we see that that 0.5% can have a dramatic impact on the trajectory of your life. So we think we do have a voice in this conversation. We think we can contribute to it if we can get people to focus on that 99.5%, right? And how similar we all are and not focus on the 0.5%. Um, hopefully we can have a positive impact here. And your CEO, speaking of having a voice, your CEO, Anne, has been very vocal about her responsibility to fight racism. And what, how have you seen that impact your employees when their CEO is taking this so personally? You know, there have always been conversations at uh, 23andMe about diversity and inclusion and, and wanting to do more about it, both internally and externally. A lot of scientists running around the building, and a lot of them are really concerned about this. It's also, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a diverse workforce. But there's always been a level of caution there because people didn't really know how the top level of the organization was going to react or where they stood. And being the CEO, the founder, and a member of the board, that's the top level, right? And so when she comes out with a strong statement like that, it removes that layer of caution and, and really makes people feel like they can step forward and start, you know, even if it's just making, making suggestions, but also step forward and start making changes. She also said very publicly that she's holding herself accountable, holding 23andMe accountable, and she's inviting our customers to hold us accountable. And so that also puts all of us there on notice that we need to start paying attention to this and we need to start doing something about it. And I'll, I want to get into the customer aspect of this in a few minutes. But first, you brought up something really important, and that is, you know, it has to, the conversation has to be starting at the, at the top. It's almost like employees need to have the permission that it's okay for us to have these uncomfortable conversations. And Smita, you brought up the empathy circles, which is something we started at Zendesk uh, last Friday. And our entire C staff was there, which was incredible to see and to, that they were participating in that conversation, or probably more importantly, they were listening to the conversation. We've always been an open organization, but why has this, why haven't we talked about this before? Why is it so challenging to have these type of conversations at work? Yeah, uh, very good question, Zara. And I think uh, um, it's not just about Zendesk, right? Any corporation, when people are walking through the doors of any company, we are all, not they, we are all trying to bring our A game on. Right. We're all trying to put our personal life, check it, check it out of the door and come in and say, I'm the type A employee. I am going to give it my best shot and I am this person. And this person is not the whole person, right? So what you're seeing from me is what I want you to see. And what our empathy circles created was created this forum and you said it very well, which is we had to work hard at it, right? So we, did, we couldn't take it for granted, even at such a fantastic company like Zendesk where our core our core value is around empathy. Even there, we had to work through to say that, look, we are going to create a safe space where there is psychological safety to bring your whole self, right? And that doesn't mean just who you are. You're a customer service representative. You are a DEI person, but I'm also someone that you're not seeing me outside the door. And what we were able to create, and again, 
kudos to the company and kudos to the leadership and kudos to the employees, the brave, bold employees who came in and shared their personal experiences, right? And I don't think we can take any credit for it. What we can do is give the owners and give the credit to our employees who said, you know, this is how I, how the, for example, there was one employee who said, I have passed off as being white my entire life. And I have mm -hmm. seen the privilege that comes with my skin color and I'm biracial. And I've seen how my dad, who is black, being called upon over and over again and not get the privilege that I get, right? So to hear that, it's one thing to kind of read it in a newspaper or read it as some episode somewhere. And another for our senior executives to hear that, wow, I have an employee who's lived through this. And that brings it home and that's personal. And any good company would, any good leader in any good company would say, I can't let that happen. I can't let an employee feel like he or she or they don't belong here. And that was the first step forward for us. And I think it's a huge step forward for us. So we all work for wonderful companies who are bringing this to the forefront, this conversation, these very challenging topics. But we have a question uh, from, uh, from a, a listener right now. And she asks, what do you do when you don't have leaders who are coming forth and and opening the doors to these type of conversations and maybe haven't you know addressed this in a, a very good way and they're not dealing with the conversations with employees and coworkers. Uh, what do you do then how do you bring this to hr how do you bring this to the executive level and say we we need a better response Ina Marie, how uh, I, I'd love I'd love to jump in here, uh, Sarah, because I think that's a really real question. Um, it's interesting as I've watched and appreciated all we've been doing at Zendesk. Um, I've been having conversations with others who are doing having this exact experience. Like it's just silent, and like what do you do with that silence? So a couple of things that I would offer. I do hope and expect that your human resource. Um, you know, department area is an ally. And that is a, a safe space that I would encourage you to go to and hopefully find that partnership to work through what is the right way to speak up and to speak out. The other thing is, um, if you have employee resource groups, if you listen to Smita's story, what is at the heart of the story is not waiting for leaders necessarily to speak up. The first empathy circle idea and concept actually came from one employee who was in our Madison office who said, I can't, you know, just stand here. I'm going to create space. And she went out and she created a space for her colleagues to join her. And there was strength in numbers. And through the power of those employees continuing to say and share that space with others, there was a movement born. So while I truly believe every CEO, every executive right now should be asking, what can I do and, and leading from the front, it doesn't always start that way. And so look for that allyship, that partnership in your human resources and look for it in your colleagues and role model really what then leaders should do because I think it's pretty hard to stay silent when you see that courageous, mm -hmm. you know, sort of raw vulnerability of your workforce come forward. So. We're getting some really powerful questions that are coming in around empowering customer service uh, representatives. And, and Kent, this is something that we were actually talking about last night. And it's a little bit more than even empowering them. It's really about how do we support them because they are frequently the individuals who are on that discrimination side. Uh, all too often people act in a way that they otherwise wouldn't when they're face to face with someone, uh, particularly when they hear maybe an accent that they don't recognize, or they have a predisposition to what they think that person looks you know, like on the other end of that phone or that email because of their accent or their, or their way of speech. So how do we go about ensuring that you know, we are we're supporting those frontline agents. Yeah, that's a tough one. It's something we're uh, thinking about quite a bit. Um, you know, for us, what we're doing is, um, you know, the, the term space uh, is being used. We, we try to give people space. We, we have told them um, that 
we're not watching the typical metrics that a lot of customer service managers would look at um, and you know, backing off on the productivity metrics, let's say, and instead of just encouraging them to take some, some time to process. So we have to remember that all the different things that are going on right now, like it's not, it's, remember way back in the old days when we were all sitting in an office together and when you had a problem or, or you needed to talk to somebody, you could just kind of lean over and talk to the person next mm -hmm. to you and vent a little bit or process. That's not the case anymore. We're all isolated like we are here. Um, which makes it even more difficult. So we're trying to facilitate channels which, through which they can talk to other people on the team. It's Slack, it's chat, it's texting, it's picking up the phone and calling people, or letting them know that they can take a few minutes to just get up and move around, to step outside, get some fresh air, get some sunshine, um, go for a walk. Um, you know, another thing we're doing at 23andMe is um, we create these just real simple documents and we kind of circulate them throughout headquarters and let everybody kind of throw in their notes of gratitude and appreciation for those teams. And then we put it in a PDF and send it off and we tell them to, you know, throughout the day, open this up and get some positive messages um, to balance it out. Um, and again, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's the COVID that they're dealing with. There's the isolation they're dealing with. And now there's the, um, you know, with us, we we did we participated in Blackout Tuesday, which created a lot of um, uh, a lot of response from our customers, uh, positive and negative. And and it, it, the way that usually works out is the positive stuff comes in really early. The negative stuff can keep going for a while. Mm -hmm. you know, it has a longer tail. Those people that want to rage are going to rage for a while. And so we, we try to provide balance, right? You know, the customers can provide some balance, but you know, we try to provide balance internally as well. Let's, let's dive into that customer piece for a bit. We're, we have a question uh, that's very similar to that that's come through and it's, you know, how do you respond to customers who are angry because of something that you've put out publicly about the company's values and they don't share those same values? And we actually had a, a, a similar question come in from one of our own employees on the empathy circle last week. And this was something that, that hit me hard, probably one of the hardest conversations. And it was a, a, a young woman uh, who was in a customer meeting and the customer didn't realize that she was on the phone yet. And the customer made some disparaging remarks. And she had to leave that call because it struck her so personally. And, and we should never have to put our employees you know, into a situation like that, but they're going to get into those situations. So how do we, how do we help them when they're in that? And, and how do we empower them to, to make their voice heard, but also to help educate our customer at the same time? Yeah, educating the customer is um, is a tough one. You know, we're trying to do that with the messaging from our CEO, but it also it, it's that's a you know the whole world has to do that, and and our product hopefully will do that as well. Um, supporting the agents, you know, um, in every business is going to be a little bit different, I guess. But we've always told them that if you find yourself in an uncomfortable situation, get out of it. You can end the call, you can end the conversation, or you can hand it off to somebody else. Um, we do have some people on our team that are uh, very sort of passionate about this and, and they volunteer. It's um, something I, I, I watch closely, but these people volunteer to, to really dive in and really handle all the negative stuff. And I, I'm careful not to let them get overwhelmed with it, but mm -hmm. they've actually volunteered to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, we also, um, you know, a lot of those negative messages will include something along the lines of, you know, I don't want to do business with you anymore. We don't really get into an argument with or engage with some of that stuff. Um, but instead, what we'll do is just a, a, a quick response. You'll see this on our social media feeds. And, you know, if you, you um, want to end your association with us, here's the link where you can go to delete your account. Done. Yeah. You know, you could go so far as to, I think many of you probably saw what Jeff Bezos did over the weekend. He posted um, uh, some of the messages he was receiving from customers. We saw stuff very similar to that. And, you know, he, he was closing those messages saying, you're the type of customer I'm happy to see, or I'm happy to lose. You know, we haven't gone that far, but I, I think that message that we send, like, here's the link, here's where you can go in your account to delete it. it it's, it's, it's kind of similar, right? You know, here's where we are, here's the stand we're taking. We're not going to change from that if you don't want to associate with that. Okay. 
And that's very powerful for your employees to know that the company has their back. And that really goes to policy, doesn't it? Uh, We were talking about this uh, also last evening that as an organization, you know, it's your responsibility to put out those policies of protection. Yes, I, I, I just want to say, Sarah, we're having this conversation right now because, as I said, the solutions are systemic. They're not just one thing. It's, a, it's an entire system that has to change. And in the same way that we protect our employees from sexual harassment and from other forms of discrimination, I think it is time for us to make sure that our policies support our employees from racial discrimination and from harm psychologically, emotionally, mentally, physically, um, you know, in those environments. And so I'm delighted that my legal partners at Zendesk have joined me to retake a look at those policies and make sure that they are updated and strong and forceful to protect and have our employees' backs. It, It is so important. Um, And and I just want to say this isn't the first time we've gone through this, right? We've seen this with Me Too movement, where we decided to take stands. We've seen this with LGBTQ, you know, communities and taking stands there. We need to take the same stance with racial injustice. And if I could add to that, and I think uh, so eloquently put both by Kent and Ina Marie, um, we've got to have systemic policies in place, we've got to have a clear stand in place about, you know, are we willing to lose our customer or, and at what point are we going to say, you know what, here's your exit button. Uh, And all those are very bold moves. But at the same time, I think I would also reiterate that the support that we can provide to our, to our own employees within the family, I think that's very important, right? So we can't, again, to be, to be a realist here, we can't solve for issues that have existed in the world, not just in the US, for, forever, right? All kinds of phobias, all kinds of isms. We can't possibly start solving for everything at once. But what we can do is if our employee is facing a difficult situation with a customer, we have their back, right? We, they, there is a place where they can come in and talk about it. There is a place that they can express their feelings and then go back almost recover from that because everything that happens, every slight and every microaggression that happens takes a toll on your emotional health, right? Is there a way where you can go back and get a slight recovery and go back to the battleground almost, right? So that's what we are trying to create at Zendesk and uh, I'm sure at 23 and Me Too. Uh, a quick little time check. We typically end this at the top of the hour. We are going to go an additional 15 minutes. So if you keep asking questions, we're going to keep answering them. So, uh, and then we will also have some resources at the end of this uh, where we'll provide some additional uh, ways that people can educate themselves, educate others. And we also have uh, some guidance around allyship. So the next few things that we're going to talk about in the last 15 minutes are really around allyship and also about what we can do on a personal level because those are frequently the things that we can change. We may not have the opportunity to change what's happening in our own organization, but it can start uh, on on a personal level. And that actually leads to uh, another question that one of our listeners has, and, and that is, this person does not work for a company where this is a conversation that's happening. And they're asking, how do you set up empathy circles? And how do you do that when everyone's remote? Uh, And Smita, I know you can answer this because we just did this and it was extraordinary. Yeah. And um, the, the fact of the matter is everyone is remote now, right? So there is no, in a way that is an equalizer, but there are so many other disparities there under that statement. But Uh, To be very specific about your answer, uh, about your question, how do you set this up when the organization is not ready? I think you need to start by finding your allies. There has to be a group of people or individuals who are feeling a certain way about these things, right? And when I say these things, it's not just about race. It's not just about one topic, especially as we're thinking about the organizations that we predominantly operate in and companies we operate in. It's a fairly young employee base where we typically operate in. It is a very woke audience. And regardless of your skin, your sexual orientation, your background, you stand up for what is right. And you just have to reach out to see who cares about the issues and not 
create boundaries about who can attend and who cannot attend, right? Be open, be inclusive, because your allies need to be in this conversation too. You can't have these conversations in echo chambers. You've got to break through those echo chambers. And once you start reaching out, that's, that's again, speaking from real life experience here, we are all remote here. We reached out, we started having these conversations. And again, going back to what I never said, we won't take any credit for this. It was an employee sitting in Madison who sent out an email to who she thought were allies, right? And the simple email said, I know we are hurting. Here's a Zoom call. You can come in, you can listen, you can talk, you can cry, you can be quiet, or you can just be there, right? But here's a space for you. And that's how this movement started, right? So I think it's about taking the first step forward and being open and meeting people where they are, because you don't have to be perfect to be an ally. You just have to start that, take that first step. And what I so liked about the, the empathy circles and about the conversation we had around allies is that you can just listen too. And that's, it's really important to listen and understand what your fellow, your, your coworkers are going through and what their families have been through. And that's one of the first steps in actually becoming an ally, isn't it? Absolutely. I think, uh, oh when it comes to and not just about the topic of racism in general when we talk about diversity equity inclusion they seem like very heavy topics right and oftentimes people feel this, this is like walking on eggshells i don't have the background i should just keep quiet i, sh I should not be having any conversation and uh, you know one of the blog posts that we posted uh, was that being you know silence is complicity right this is not the time to be quiet but this is definitely a time to take a pause and listen because every person has their own lived experience. So listen before you speak, but definitely speak up and stand up for what is right. I think that is, that is such an extraordinary distinction because I certainly have heard people, I don't want to say use that incorrectly, but they've misinterpreted the, the silence component uh, where people have said, I need a moment to listen. I need a moment to understand before I have a verbal reaction. And that's a fair thing to do. So we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be angry at individuals who do need that moment to figure things out. Very well said, very well said. Yeah. We, we all, yeah, go ahead, Anamuri. No, I was just gonna say, I heard something that really said it for me the other day. Like the words that people choose to use initially, they may not be perfect. And we all need to give each other a little bit of room to stumble or maybe not say the exact words. And, and it was a recommendation that even when you are having these environments or someone reaches out, you know, give a little bit of grace, you know, uh, provide a little bit of like somebody to maybe not get it exactly right because these are, these are not easy things to um, put words to. Part of you know, what I know I personally experienced right after the death of George Floyd is I didn't even have words. And I'm, you know, I'm a person who uses words a lot, but it's okay to, so you're right, our statement of silence, I think what we're saying is like, you know, don't bury it, don't pretend it doesn't exist. That's very different than maybe you don't have the words and know exactly what to say. And I love, I love some of the notes I've gotten, which just basically say, I'm standing with you, or I see you, you know, it's just, and I think that's allyship, you know, uh, to know that of your, your leaders and your coworkers. Kent, how are you talking about allyship within 23andMe? Yeah, our, uh, yeah, Ina Marie's counterpart at our company is doing a lot of work there to create the, these circles, um, a lot of uh, meetings um, where we're just inviting everybody to join in. Um, from there, we, we develop some uh, projects that people want to work on, break out into smaller circles um, and move those forward. You know, all that stuff's just kicking off, but um, the big thing is encouraging people to get involved and to to feel safe. I, I also agree with what Ina Marie said there that uh, kind of removing the um, the fear. I think a lot of people are afraid sometimes to say something because they just don't quite have the right words. They, they're afraid they'll get use the wrong terms, right? And just saying, look, we're not worried about that right now. What we're worried about is action and, and ideas and, and moving things forward. And so creating that space too, and, and just setting the, the ground rules there where you know, just, just, just join in. Uh, you know, we're not going to judge at this point. 
and that's so important. And it's something, if you are a contact center leader, if you run a customer experience organization, if you're a leader of any kind in your company, it's take these moments to get your employees together and talk to them and provide that same, that safe space. Uh, and to your, to your point, there's also, there may not be the wrong thing to say, but there certainly are better things to say. <laughs> and I was, I was listening to uh, a, a podcast uh, earlier this week and the question was, you know, you know, how are you, you know, and why is, how are you, to one of a, uh, to a black coworker, that can be a really polarizing thing to ask right now. Uh, why is that and what should we ask instead? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick off and I know Smita has views on this. Two things come to mind. Number one, sometimes people are saying, how are you? And they're not really prepared to hear the answer. And so it can come across very perfunctionally or just like not really being ready to listen. But mostly what I hear, and I know I experience is that that puts a lot of weight back on the other person mm -hmm. to educate and to bring those feelings to words and to share that. That's a lot to carry. And so what I think is more important, I'll go back to those statements, is when you don't say, how are you, and look to that person of color or African-American person to educate you is that when you go off and educate yourself, start reading, start learning, start listening, and then say things like, I'm here, I see it, I want to be a part of the solution, and don't put the responsibility back on that Black coworker to educate and carry you along. We all got to do our own personal work. This is very, it starts very personally. And I know I've heard my black brothers and sisters say, that's a lot for me to carry, to have to keep educating and, and, and building that awareness into my you know, non-black coworkers. And I'm tired and I don't wanna have to do that and carry my own you know, pain and struggles and emotions that I may have. And along those oh, lines, it was, <laughs> Did you have something else to add to me this? Sorry. No, I just said very well said. That's all. I mean, nothing to add. Very well said. So let's carry, let's keep going with that on, you know, how can we personally do better? Education is a piece of this, right? But what do I, as a white woman, how do, how do I do better with this? How do, how do I make the change, not just this temporary, I put something out on social media, I stand with you know, my coworkers. How do I make a permanent change? Yeah, I, if I could take a stab at that, right? Again, no right or wrong answer here. Again, trying to be completely humble here because each of us, again, comes with very different experiences, right? So there is no, there is no book or here are the five things you do. But I think as seasoned leaders and professionals in our own fields, many of us, you know, about 130 plus participants, we're all pretty good seasoned professionals and we are continuously upping our game when it comes to our jobs, right? And this is no longer, you know, that good thing that HR is asking you to do. This is about being a good human. This is about being a good professional. And this is at the end, being a good leader. And to be a good leader, you have to constantly up your game. And this is a part of that. You have to take the onus to educate yourself. If you're in a new country and you can no longer kind of hide in the excuse that I was born or raised here in this country, so I don't know. Well, the reality is if you look around in your neighborhood, in your schools, in the churches, in the community, it is an increasingly diverse place. You, the onus is on you to educate yourself, to learn, and constantly be that humble, empathetic listener and be an ally, right? And, and the more we connect with people personally, it's based on my own personal experiences, the more we become comfortable and confident that I am an ally and I can speak up confidently about certain issues. So that would be my first tip. Thank you. At the end of this discussion, we're actually going to have a slide on allyship and what you can do. Uh, please snap a photo of it, share it, just ingrain it, print it out, 
uh, it, if you aren't, if you don't have access uh, to the end of this, please let us know and we'll go ahead and, and send that slide to you because I think it's, it's truly so important and powerful. Uh, in our last few minutes, you know, we, we are getting some questions around, you know, what, what should I do now? How do I keep this from being, you know, how do we as a collective keep this from just being a hashtag uh, or a Slack channel in our organization? I'll, I'll just kick off here. Um, again, I'll go back to that. Think of it as a system. You know, what I love about our five points is it's, it's listening, but it's also equipping it's investing, it's changing policy. So I think if you're in a company and you're looking to start or continue on the journey, take the wide view, take the systemic view. Because what I've learned in doing 30 years of HR work and, and people work in, in people's systems, the more things are connected and wired, the harder they are to disappear. It's when we set something on the side as its own separate concept or program, it's easy to then just lose it. That's kind of more strategic. The very tactical thing that I heard the other day that I loved is set up reoccurring discussions and meetings. Someone even said they were putting something on their calendar six months from now, nine months from now, 12 months from now with the expectation that we the work is long. It's a marathon. It is not a sprint. There are some early wins, but we can expect to be having this discussion a year from now. And I loved the calendaring of it with that expectation. It was very tactical, but real. That's, that is such a great tip and one that I know people are, are actually going to take. Kent, how about, how about you at, at 23andMe? Yeah, I like uh, what Ida Marie was just saying that uh, are starting to calendar it out now and schedule things. And and uh, if you have a, uh, a goal setting process, we use OKRs, objectives and key results. Um, you need to start adding it there as well, uh, just so that you're you have something that you're held accountable to uh, throughout the year. Something you visit, whatever cadence you might use, monthly, quarterly, annually, to see how you're doing. That's great, Smita. I think I'll add to, I think, I think both Aina Marie and Ken said two very distinct but important points. The only thing I'll add to it, if you're an individual and you don't have the power to impact a system or you know, be a leader and uh, have some major policy change, you do have your voice and don't lose that voice. I know in times of crisis, it's, it's probably a bit easier to find your voice, but have that courage and keep pushing because every change that happens in organizations, in countries, in the system starts with one individual voice. So keep pushing, keep, be respectful, but keep pushing your organization for results and ask them to show their commitment, like Anna Marie said, six months, 12 months, two years, three years down the line. And that keeps people, companies, leaders, all of us on our toes, and it's a good push. Well, thank you all so very much for that. This, the power behind Black Lives Matter and the conversations that we're all having now is that we're all going to be better humans from this. We're all learning, which is extraordinary. And we're connecting in ways that we, we definitely should have done a long time ago. But I personally am grateful that we're having these conversations now. So thank you to everyone who joined us today. This is easily the highlight of my week. And thank you to everyone who shared uh, asked a question, shared a story, and a special thanks, Kent, to you and to 23andMe. Uh, here on a CX moment, we're going to start pivoting from COVID-19 conversations and focus more on conversations like this and what's next for our CX organizations and how we can all adapt to our changes in our business and our customers. And so please join us next week when we talk data and customer insights uh, with Stitch Fix. Connect with us on our social channels and, and in our community. And as promised, uh, here are our call to action, hashtag be an ally. And here are some tips around how to be an ally. So with that, be safe, be helpful, and we'll all chat again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.